to Mark chapter 2 as we continue to go through the gospel of Mark. If anybody needs a Bible, just slip your hand up and we'll get one to you. Um, Now, as you turn there, when we consider people coming to Jesus, we sometimes think about it in the wrong way. We often think about it in terms of the effects rather than the root issue. In fact, we can be uncomfortable dealing with the root issue. which is sin. We so often want, you know, some people might think, oh, you know, I want to get right with the Lord because I want my marriage to be straightened out or I want to stop doing this or start doing that. And that's not the heart of the matter. That's not the issue. The issue is sin in dealing with that. And one reason that the church is very ineffective today is that we don't deal directly with the issue of sin. So as we take a look at this passage, we'll see how Jesus deals with mankind's real problem. As we read here, we look at the story of the paralytic. Beginning with verses 2, or excuse me, verses 1 to 4, we see that we bring people to Jesus to get fixed. As it says in verses 1 and 2, And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even at the door. And he preached the word to them. As we saw last time, uh, after the healing of the leper, the guy Jesus told not to say anything, and he went around telling everybody, that it became difficult for him to minister, for him to move about publicly because of all the attention, because of all the crowds. Though sometimes it's hard to do things because of crowds. Just look at Christmas shopping. You know, it's hard to get anything accomplished because there's so many, so many people out. And that was that way with Jesus' ministry. So many people were coming to him, you know, and for various reasons. Some legitimate, some not legitimate. And it was causing, it was causing uh, this hindering of the ministry. So after things calmed down a little bit, Uh, Jesus was able to quietly slip back into Capernaum, back to Peter's house where he was staying. But it didn't take long for word to get out that he was there. And the truth is that where God is moving, people are attracted. And, you know, he was obviously moving in the ministry of Jesus. You know, as we seek to minister to people, we should be constantly praying for the moving of God's spirit because it's a work of God that people are attracted to, not just us doing things. Um, John 6.63 says, It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. John Wesley wrote, I set myself on fire and people come to watch me burn. Obviously, he wasn't meaning that literally, but figuratively, as he desires to be on fire for the Lord, and as he is that way, depending on the Lord, people come to watch him burn. So many People uh, followed, came out, that there was no room for them at, in the house or even at the door. Imagine that. The house was so 
packed with people. They couldn't, you couldn't even get around the door to look in through the door. But Jesus took this opportunity to teach God's word to the people who had gathered. The word used for preaching here, it's interesting, it's not the normal word for preaching. As a, a de, like a declaration, but it's, but it's more that Jesus spoke the word to them. It's certainly not an overstatement to say Jesus gave a priority to the word. And he simply conversationally, directly shared the word with people. And think about ourselves, you know, we get all, you know, caught up, freaked out or whatever about when we think about sharing with other people. And, uh, you know, we get this feeling that it's got to be something intense, got to be something dramatic, you know, thus saith the Lord. And, you know, to the person in the grocery store line, right? But it's not that way always. It's, it's Jesus here. He was just simply teaching the word to him, simply saying what the word said to him. And that's all we have to do. You know, you get in conversations with people about different subjects from the scripture or, you know, in life, and you just simply share how the scripture applies to that situation. That's what, that's a witness. That's a real witness. So Jesus gave, obviously, priority to the word. That's what he was about. And if he gave such priority to the word, certainly we, we should as well. And be ready to share conversationally with other people. And then we read in verse 3 that they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Now, Four men come bringing their friend who is a paralytic. Uh, a paralytic was a person who suffered a disease of the simple central, cent, central nervous system that affected a, a loss of voluntary motor control. It was often sudden and onset and incurable. I'm sure these men didn't know all the details about their friend's condition, but what they knew was they had to get him to Jesus. We're great these days at telling other people how they can solve their problems, but often we overlook their primary need. We'll take our friends to doctors, counselors, and there's certainly a place for that. But are we willing to bring them to Jesus first in prayer and then personally? Are we willing to do that to get to people's real heart issues? As we'll see, these guys were willing to do anything necessary to get their friend to Jesus. And what are we willing to do? for the same, for the same reason. Verse 4, we read, And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was, so that when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Get this picture. Here these four guys come carrying their friend. He's, they're either, he's either on kind of like a pallet, a board, or possibly blankets, you know, or some translations even say bed. So they're, these guys on four corners, they're carrying this guy down the street, right? They're coming up, and remember the picture. There's the synagogue right there, then there's Peter's house right here. Door possibly over this way. So there's all this crowd around there that they can't even get into the door. They kind of look around. They see where Jesus is. They go houses back then. They treated the roof like a lanai. 
So there's usually steps going up the side of the house. So they go up the side of the house, go up the steps, carry the guy up the steps, and they're there. They spotted, they kind of located the spot where Jesus would be below that, and they started taking the roof off. Man, talk about commitment. We're getting him to the Lord no matter what it takes. We're going to take this house down if we have to. We're going to get him to Jesus. The roofs back then, the way they built their roofs, there were beams going across, cross beams. Then they'd put thatch on top of it, then dirt. Sometimes they would use tiles as Luke chapter 5 says they removed tiles, so there were tiles there that they had on top of that as well. All of that insulation, that sort of thing. So they go up there and they start pulling apart the roof. Then, after they do that, they begin letting him down through the hole. Imagine, though, if you're inside there, you know, Jesus is speaking, you're just calmly there listening, and you start feeling plop, plop stuff drops, drop, starts dropping on your head. And you look up, what is going on here? I'm inside, it's not raining, you know. To look up and you see this hole open, start to open up in the roof, a little beam of light coming through, and then the hole gets bigger and bigger, and then they let this guy, whoa, what are they doing? They're letting a guy down up in front of you there. You see, they couldn't get to, the issue was that they couldn't get this man to Jesus because of the crowd. And it's often true that the crowd of the world will often prevent you from getting to Jesus, from getting close to Jesus. How we can be so distracted by the crowd, by the mentality of the crowd that we don't come to Jesus. So it's better or more helpful not to follow the crowd. So these men did what I said. They carried him up there and they took him up there and dug through the roof and began letting him down. These friends... Interesting, you might think, well, they're letting, have they thought this all the way through? They're letting him down through the roof. And you think, well, how's he going to get out? They, you see, they were expecting. They were expecting in what the Lord was going to do because they had to figure, you know, if we let him down, we're up on the roof, we can't get him out. He's going to have to get out on his own. He's going to have to walk out of there. So they were depending upon Jesus, they were counting on Jesus doing, an, a work on, uh, doing a work in his life. And this is part of what you see with these guys, is as they come to the Lord, as they're bringing him to the Lord, there's this expectancy that Jesus is going to work. Psalm 62, 5 says, My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. That's incredibly important. Who is your expectation from or of? Are you expecting other people to do things for you? Or do we expect the Lord? You know, this is so important in how we live our lives because on the one hand, we can spend our lives trying to manipulate people to try them to get things done for us. Or we can, if we really expect the Lord to work in our lives, if that's our relationship with the Lord, we really expect Him to be looking or working in our lives, we're going to be looking to Him. And we won't be manipulating people. My expectation is from Him. So I'm seeking Him. I'm looking... To, to him. I'm asking him. I'm knocking. I'm seeking. I'm asking. My expectation is from him. 
Do you count on Jesus to work in your life and the lives of others? Do you pray for others with expectancy? Do you share God's word expecting it to have an impact on people's lives? And then we see in verses 5 through 7 that Jesus works in people's hearts for salvation, as it said. Now, Jesus, now when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Notice, Jesus saw their faith, the faith of these men, and possibly that could include the faith of the paralytic as well. But he, he saw their faith. How did he see their faith? He saw it in what they were doing. And man, they peeled the roof off. They were expecting something to happen. They were going to the Lord. They were determined. They had a determined faith to see Jesus work. They had confidence in the power and the willingness of Jesus to work. And Jesus saw the expression of the faith that they had in what they did. James teaches us that we, that if you have faith, you'll demonstrate it by your works. And that's certainly what they were doing. What they did was merely an expression of the faith and trust that they had in Jesus. If we truly believe that Jesus is willing and able to work in and through our lives, we will act like it and we'll act on it. Romans 4, verses 20 to 22, we, re we read about Abraham, as it said, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able to perform, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. The people had seen Jesus heal before, and that's probably what they were expecting. They said, oh, he's letting him down. They're letting him down, and there's going to be a healing here. Everybody was anticipate, anticipating, oh, we're going to see another healing. But what Jesus did totally shocked them. As he looked at him and said, son, imagine that. Son, speaking of relationship, not, you're not disregarded. Son, your sins are forgiven you. He's getting to the heart of the man's need and not just dealing merely with a symptom. Now, In dealing with this issue, as he says, your sins are forgiven you, it raises the question, was his condition because of sin, individually? And first you have to realize that ultimately all sickness is because of sin, and that is, understand me, in the context of original sin. Because of original sin, because of Adam's sin, sickness, disease, those things entered into the world. So that's the condition we have. Doesn't mean that someone necessarily individually sinned and then an illness they get is a judgment on that sin. At times in scripture it is, but not always. You can't make it a pat thing. You know, it can't be, you know, oh, that dude's got a cold. There must be sin in his life. It's not that way. But we get sick. We get diseases because this, we live in a fallen world. And those are the conditions. Whatever the case in this situation, Jesus was addressing the man's greatest need. And that's the forgiveness of sins. Mankind's greatest need 
And each individual's greatest need is the forgiveness of sin. When we seek to minister to people in their needs, that ministry falls short if we don't share with them how they can receive forgiveness of sins. It falls short. Now, in verse 6, we read, And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. You know the scribes. We've talked about them before. Those are those Jewish lawyers, basically. They've spent all their time studying the law and analyzing it in detail, even coming up with extra laws to put a wall around the law so they wouldn't, so no one would run the risk of breaking the law. And they were sitting there in the house and they probably thought it was their responsibility to judge the legitimacy of anything that was going on there. You can just see them sitting there looking. Is anybody doing anything out of order? Is anything one doing anything they shouldn't? You know, it's like the person with the steel ruler, right? You know, as soon as you do anything wrong. That's the way they were. They were about sitting there and judging. They weren't about ministering the people. They were there to judge. And Jesus' words weren't lost on them, and they were quick to catch the significance of what he said. I thought, how audacious for this man to forgive, to say your sins are forgiven. You see, their perspective back then was you couldn't know. In fact, in some religions, it's that way. In some denominations, even, it's this way today. I think you can't know that you have forgiveness of sin till you die. On the judgment day. But oh. That's too late. You certainly need to know before then. If you're going to do anything about it. Um. 1 John 5.13 tells us, uh, in John's letter, he writes, These things I, I've written unto you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And that's what his uh, letter, his epistle was all about, having the assurance of salvation. And you can and should know that you're saved. And if you don't, I would encourage you to see me afterwards and after the service, and we can talk about it. I can show you how you can have assurance of salvation. Now, again, these scribes, they saw the logical progression of where Jesus was going, but they were unwilling to search the scriptures and take and go where it led them. They had their preconceived ideas. They had their opinions already formed, and they were looking for anything that would violate their opinions. Instead of being like Bereans and searching the scriptures and to see if these things were so. Have you ever been talking with someone who didn't want to have a rational conversation because it would violate their opinions? They just wanted to put forward their doctrinal points. I've had people like that before who don't listen to what you say in response to them. They just keep giving their, they just keep, keep giving their perspective without having a com real conversation. We're always on dangerous spiritual ground when we just reason in our hearts and don't reason from God's word. It says these guys are reasoning in their hearts. 
What's interesting is they weren't talking, the scribes there weren't talking to each other. They were just reasoning in their hearts and they were all on the same page because they had all come from the same background, gone to the same schools, had the same opinions formed, and they were stayed in their opinions. So their response was, ooh, this doesn't fit in. Reasoning in our hearts simply is a dangerous thing because as Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The only one who can know it is God. I don't even understand or know my own motives half the time. Because I'm, I'm so swayed Buy things that either make me comfortable, I would like, whatever, oh, I'd like to go. But, you know, the truth is, only God sees my heart. Only God can know fully my motives, my motivations, my heart. So I got to give my heart to him and let him work it out. Let him work it out. If we don't, if we just reason in our hearts, we spend all of our time constantly being led about by our emotions, and we can easily deceive ourselves. Now, verse 7 says, it's what they're thinking here. They say, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Notice that they were all thinking, again, thinking the same thing. Giving the same, they'd all heard the same talking points. When we share with people, we should be aware of where they're coming from and be able to respond to them accordingly. They saw that Jesus was taking to himself the spiritual prerogative of God to forgive sin, or the divine prerogative of God to forgive sin. But Jesus didn't just insinuate that he was God, he demonstrated it, as we see in verses um, 8 through 12 as we see that Jesus makes people whole. It said, but immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise and take up your bed and walk? I love this because, no, remember, they weren't saying anything. They're all thinking in their minds. They're thinking, what did he just say? He didn't say that, did he? Who does he think he is? And all this is going on in their minds. And he just looks at them. Remember, again, they haven't said a word. He looks at them and says, hey, guys, which is it easy to do? easier to do to say your friends are your sins are forgiven or to say rise take your bed and walk and their jaws had to have dropped then because he obviously demonstrated that he knew what they were thinking he interrupts the conversations that they're having in their own minds they were questioning his right to <clears throat> act like God. So he does something that only God can do, and that's to supernaturally <clears throat> comprehend their thoughts. And in this we see it's obvious that the Lord knows our thoughts. He knows what's going on in our hearts and in our minds. We shouldn't be foolish enough to think that he doesn't know what we're feeling or understand what we're going through in our lives. He knows it all. 
And the incredible thing about that, not only does he know it, but he loves us incredibly and wants to do something about it. Now, Jesus gives him kind of a logical argument here. It's what's referred to as an argument from the lesser to greater. And so he says, says to him, which is it easier to do? To say your sins are forgiven or to say arise, take up your bed and walk. Now, on face value, it's easy to say your sins are forgiven. Why is it so easy? Nobody can see it. I can say that all day. Your sins are forgiven. You know, you may have come from a particular religious traditional background where you've had, where you've done certain things and someone's pronounced, oh, it's forgiven you, but is it? How do we know? Here, how do we know that person has authority? And here's the question here. Here's the situation here. Is that this is what they were questioning of Jesus. Of Jesus. How, where is this authority? Who does he think that he is? And he uses this argument to say, okay, which is it easier to say? Your sins are forgiven. As I said, that simple. Or if I say, arise, take up your bed and walk. Whoa. That'll see, we'll see if that happens or not. That's a much bigger step. Much bigger step. Don't only trust God with one size problems. He can handle them all, whether it be something visible or invisible. He knows what you're going through. And in verses 10 and 11, we read that Jesus responds to them further. He says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. So as a demonstration of Jesus' ability for, to forgive sins here and now, he says the words, repeating the words that he had said, the hypothetical words that he said to him, repeating them to the paralytic. He also uses the messianic title, of for himself, the son of man. And now, using the title, a son of man, is kind of interesting because in Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, it's specifically a messianic title. But it's used also in the book of Ezekiel, but it's used in kind of a generic way in Ezekiel. Sometimes Ezekiel is referred to as the son of man. And so, it's, in itself, it's kind of ambiguous. So they were always wondering, he's called himself the Son of Man. Exactly what's he mean? They're thinking of the, the title from they're thinking from the title from Daniel, but they're also thinking Ezekiel. Which one is he taken? Which one does he mean? And so they're wondering, they're looking at the situation, and, he's saying, and he says to them, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. So they're confused there, then, but then he says, then it says, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, notice, individual, specific, detailed, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. He tells the paralytic to do two things that were immediate and specific, that would make it perfectly obvious that everyone see, would see exactly what he did. He said, Arise, 
and take up your bed. There'd be no question that he had healed the person if he did this. And it's interesting, too, he told them, you know, in the hypothetical, he said to take up your bed and walk. But in this one, but when he actually says it to the man, he says, uh, arise and go to your house. A couple of things here. One, he uses a word when he says, arise, take up your bed and walk. That means it's that word for walk that isn't just talking about the physical act of walking. It's talking about the manner, your manner of life. It's saying, he's saying, rise, arise, take up your bed, and go out and live your life. Go live your life. But when he says it to the man individually, he says, go to your house. And we place those two together, and, and you have this picture of, you know, live out your life in your relationship with the Lord, your walk, and begin with your house. Begin living your life in the Lord at your house. A continuous action to walk. Your sins are forgiven. You've been restored. Go about your life and begin it at home. Restore relationships, allow your relationships to be restored because you have a changed life. In the light of what the Lord's done for you, begin to live it and begin it at home. Jesus acted with the power of God and claimed equality with God and made good his claim. And as I mentioned before, they thought at that time, many thought at that time, you would have to wait until the judgment day to know whether you had salvation or not, whether you had forgiveness of sins. Have you ever asked anyone, maybe you've asked some of those uh, evangelistic questions like, um, suppose you were to die tonight and stand before God and he were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? Might say, oh, it's a good person or whatever. Or if you ask somebody, do you know you're going to heaven? You might get the response, well, I think so. Or I hope so. But the scripture tells us that we're to know, as we read in 1 John 5, 13. And if there's anyone here who isn't sure that they have eternal life or just hopes that they'll have eternal life, please don't leave here today without being sure. You can and sh should be sure that you have eternal life. Now in verse 12, it says, immediately, I love that word, how Mark uses it so often, but it's so timely, and it says, okay, you have all of this going on. Remember, let's sum it up here. You had the guys come up on the roof. They dig out the roof. They let the guy down. Jesus says, tells him, your sins are forgiven. The scribes are questioning, saying, who does this guy think he is forgiving sins? Jesus responds to him, which is it easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, or rise, take up your bed and walk. But that, you're the son of, that you might know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. And he turns and says to the paralytic, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And you get those guys' heads had to be spinning him by this point. He gets up and... And it says here, it says, and immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went out in the presence of them all. And so that all were amazed and glorified God when they saw, 
or said, we never saw anything like this. They saw the power of God at work. Because of the faith that these guys had, knowing God would work, if they come to him in faith, knowing that Jesus would work. And this paralytic, as it says here, he just stands up, he gets up, picks up his bed. Again, it might have been a mat, might have been, and he just starts walking out. And you get, I got to get the picture of the scribe sitting and going, just kind of following him with, his, with their eyes as he goes out, probably with their jaws open at the same time. I go, what's going on here? Because it didn't fit in their grid. It didn't fit in, you know, he can't do that. You know, all of that, Jesus did it, and they were blown away. We have a testimony. Each of us have a testimony in our lives. Each of us who know Jesus. Because as the scripture says, he, he made us alive who are dead in our trespasses and sins. In a very real spiritual sense, you were raised from the dead. And Jesus calls you, he calls me to walk. And to walk in front of other people, in the presence of other people. To live out, to walk out that life, that new life that we have in Christ. Different than we were before. Different than other people live. And so that people should be able to look at us and then say, we never saw anything like this. It doesn't fit. Yeah, we've seen religious people. We've seen people doing the church thing and all of that and going, and going out and living like everyone else. But when they see someone that will live the Christian life by the power of the Holy Spirit, walking in newness of life, being led by the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, loving people, blessing people, ministering to people, they'll say, I've never seen anything like this. And it'll cause them to think. That's why Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill that can't be hidden. Why? Because he's done something to you. He's done something in you. In fact, in you, the gospel working in you is the most subversive for force on earth. You know, just to speak about politics for a minute, as we look at this whole, you know, people talking about the danger of socialism in this country and creeping socialism and how it's subversive to our government and constitution and all of this, well, there's a much more subversive force at work in the U.S. today. And you know what that is? You. It's me. Because what should be taking place as a result of the reality of the gospel, the Holy Spirit working in our lives, it should be working then through our lives to the people around us and then to the culture as a whole. That there'd be real change. That, be, that there would be real change. You see, Jesus desires to work in the lives of individuals, in and through it. He didn't just save you to set you on a mantelpiece. To think, oh, they look nice. I have this trophy at home. I keep it. It's the only one I ever got. 
of, I got in eighth grade for playing intramural football. And it was funny. Our team won. <laughs> you know how we won the championship? We won by a first down. The tie, score was tied, so they just did it. One of those funky things where they just, you know, who had the most, their stats were the best. So we won by the first down that I got when the only time I ever received the football they got it to me. I stepped forward. Yay, we got a first down. We won the game. I have that trophy. The plate has since fallen off the front of it, but it's one of those that are just kind of stamped out, you know, on the cheap ones you can get anywhere, any trophy shop. But that's not what the Lord does with us. He's not finished with you. He saved you, but he didn't just save you for yourself. He saved you to be that subversive influence. If that wasn't the case, as I've said before, you wouldn't be here. He left you here. You know, you know so much we, we think and we look at current events and in the news and all this, we think, Lord, when do you come back? Come back, Lord. How can it be any longer? Come back. He's the, and what does the scripture say? He's not slack concerning his promises. But he's not willing, but he's patient because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what he's left you here for. To be subversive. To speak the gospel. Again, you don't have to worry about preaching on it. You don't have to get on a soapbox or something and declare it. Just simply where you are in the circumstances that the Lord puts you, share what the Lord's done in your life. But don't simply try to get people fixed. Bring them to Jesus. That's the issue. He gets to the root of the problem, dealing with the sin in our lives. He's the only one who can make people whole. And what we need to be about is simply bringing people to Jesus bringing them into his presence, helping them to realize their need for him. And it's such an incredible thing to be able to do. To be used by God in such a way. And God's faithful to work. Again, they brought this guy, this paralytical, paralytic to this to Jesus in expectation. Or it's going to do something. Or is it going to bring him and he's going to do something? Do we share expectantly? Do we seek to minister to people expectantly? Do things saying, boy, what do you want to do? I love that when you see that in certain guys in the scripture like Jonathan, when he goes up to attack the Philistines and he says to his armor bearer, Let's go try this out. It might be the Lord wants to work. He doesn't need extra people to work, but he just might want to work. You ever think that way? Oh, maybe I can share with this person. Maybe God wants to work here. How do you find out? You do it. You just simply do it. What an awesome privilege we have. To be used by God, to partner with him, to actually allow him to use us in the salvation, eternal life of a person. But first things first, the most important thing is for us, as we said, to know that we have eternal life. And there's, if there's anyone here who hasn't yet Come to Jesus. You know, we have this figure of speech in our culture these days. 
People talk about, oh, we had a a come-to-Jesus meeting. Well, that kind of cheapens the whole thing. It's this idea that you had to confront them, but when it comes down to it, we all need to have a come-to-Jesus meeting. And that is, when we come to Jesus, we repent of our sins, we turn from our sins, and put our faith in Christ alone for our salvation. Receiving him as our Lord and Savior. That's what it means to come to Jesus. So we're going to pray. And if there's anyone here who hasn't yet done that, I just invite you to to talk to me afterwards. I'd love to pray with you. So let's pray. Father, we come before you now in the name of Jesus, and we thank you so much, Lord, for your incredible love for us, your grace and mercy, and love that's demonstrated so richly in, in Jesus, Lord, him dying for our sins on the cross. So As your word says that you so love the world that you gave your only son that whosoever believes puts their faith and trust in you alone has eternal life. We thank you for that, Lord. And we love you, Lord God. Lord, for all of us, Father, use us, we pray. Lord God, as these men brought the paralytic, brought their friend to Jesus, Lord, use us to bring people to Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord, bless you guys. Give you an incredible week in the Lord. It is simply walk in him, in newness of life. Amen. God bless you guys.